with the Historic Flight Foundation and, uh, and John Sessions. Uh, we have Colonel John Blythe is going to comfortably sit by while we discuss a couple things. And uh, I'm going to ask uh, John Sessions to come up and talk about his airplane so that Colonel Blythe has an idea what we, uh, we have sitting here. And then we're going to uh, have a, a formal introduction. Kent uh, Johnson did a lot of work for us for the squadron to bring uh, Colonel Blythe here. And uh, he's going to introduce him with a little bit of background so you all know uh, where we're starting out. And uh, then we're going to show the film, uh, Spitfire 944, which uh, is on YouTube. And it's just an outstanding short film. It won some awards as a documentary. And then we're going to hear from Colonel Blythe, let him uh, talk about his uh, experiences flying the uh, photo reconnaissance Spitfire. And uh, we'll have some time for questions. Uh, and that's basically the, uh, the plan for the next hour or so. And uh, it's basically up to how much speaking we want to do. We'll get to it. We'll, we'll, we'll get you a mic soon. Uh, John, if you'd like to come on up, appreciate it. Uh, John Sessions. Thank you very much. It's an honor to have all of you here today, and uh, especially Lieutenant Colonel Blight. You're here. Uh, by the way, sir, uh, at your instructions, we left the straps loose. There are 50 gallons in the front tank, and it takes us about 10 minutes to get the airplanes out of the way. <laughs> this is a Spitfire Mark 9E. Uh, you will occasionally meet a person normally from England, who will know every mark. I have a cheat sheet in my pocket if you ask really good questions. <laughs> but uh, about 60% of the marks were uh, Merlin-powered, Rolls-Royce 12-cylinder, and the balance were Griffin-powered. Uh, this is a Merlin-powered, prop turns the correct way, 12-cylinder, <laughs> And the 9E, the alphanumeric, the E or whatever letter follows the mark number is the indication of the wing type, which indicates the armament. So the E means a 20 millimeter cannon and a 50 caliber machine gun. That was considered the most uh, devastating combination. The machine gun is covered by a little orange red linen, Irish linen, of course patch, much as the flare gun exit point in the rear of the fuselage is covered. And those were put there so that if you can imagine some of these planes were flown three and four sorties a day, it's a major exercise to rearm the wing. The uh, panels have to be removed and, and this way the, the crew responsible for rearming the airplane could ascertain quickly whether or not the machine gun had been fired. Of course, it also served to keep the barrel from taking on mud on takeoff and landing, where they were operating uh, generally from grass strips. The Mark 9 uh, features a two-stage blower. It's good to about 38,000 feet. Uh, there are accounts of getting it higher. It was made to match up with the Focke-Wulf 190. Uh, as the war went on, and this is basically a 1944 airplane, the dogfights got higher and higher. And uh, the 190 was capable of higher altitude. The Mark V, on the other hand, was a matchup for the Messerschmitt 109. Uh, the difference visually of uh, the Mark IX is a little larger than a 5 and has the second radiator box under the wings. All of the Merlin powered uh, Spitfires have uh, cooling issues. Uh, you'll see sometimes at uh, air shows, uh, uh, we, we, we can get a little cranky in line when, uh, when Boeing does a high-speed taxi test and a Merlin's out there warming up. And uh, some of you know what I mean. Uh, but we try not to let it show in the tone of our voice over the Unicom. <laughs> uh, and sometimes we shut down and let them cool. That's just the issue. Now, as soon as you're in the air, all the problems go away. Quickly cools down. Uh, 
the airplane is 37 feet in wingspan, about 31 feet in length. It's powered by uh, a Merlin 66, it's the English version. The U.S. version is the Packard 266. And as many of you know, the English production of the Rolls-Royce Merlin could not keep pace with the demand when it became the engine of both the Spitfire and the Hurricane and the Mustang. And just a little digression, the British are the ones we have to thank for, for the Mustang being the airplane that it is, the A model that had an Allison engine which was slightly underpowered. Uh, the British with their first order of the B model Mustang insisted upon it 600 copies, so it was a good order, uh, with the British Merlin engine at the front. And that really forced us to consider that as the combination that ended up in the C and the D. And the rest of history speaks for itself. Back to the spit though. Uh, the Packard uh, Merlin in a Spit and the Packard Merlin in a Mustang are identical. Uh, about 1,700 horsepower when everything's performing. The difference is the reduction gear for the propeller. The propeller on the Spitfire is made of wood, which was uh, it's about a 16 to 9 ratio on the reduction. And the wood, if you can believe it, was an advantage in certain scenarios. If you had trouble with the landing gear and the hydraulics of landing and you had to land it on its belly, the uh, propeller would turn to toothpicks. And it's entirely possible that you would not have to overhaul the engine. Uh, whereas if you hit a metal prop on a Mustang, you've got a main bearing and a crank and lots of things to consider, a full teardown. So there, again, there are accounts of Spitfires being redeployed rather quickly after wheels up landings when necessary. The landing gear is hydraulic. The brakes are uh, air brakes and the flaps are air. Um, compressor pump comes off of the engine and it's a little, uh, it's a little lever on the uh, stick, which is not truly a stick. I would say the ailerons are a little heavy, the elevator is very light. So uh, you can tell sometimes when you're seeing a uh, low time Spitfire pilot, the, uh, the flicking up and down of the elevator, it really responds quickly. Um, other than that, uh, it's a ton lighter than a Mustang. A Mustang will beat it going downhill because of the weight, but a Spitfire will turn within a Mustang. And uh, it is absolute heaven to fly. I, uh, I wish all of you could have a chance. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, three levers on the left. Two things to think about in the center. A little O-ring plus the brake. And then you've got your gear on the right. And believing to remain true to British engineering heritage, to bring the gear up, you have to start the handle down. <laughs> to bring the gear down, you have to start the handle up. Are you with me? <laughs> Two settings on flaps, flaps and no flaps. And it's a little lever up in the top, top left. And, um, Stall speeds, depending upon the configuration, somewhere between 65 and 70 miles an hour. And the tendency is to try to land it too fast. Don't ask me how I know that. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Yes, sir. Do you know how many, about how many Spitfires were made? Total? Help me out, Mike Lavelle. 14,000? No. 20. About 22,000. 22,000, 22, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> From the late 30s until about 1950. And they really gave up hard. I mean, they, we had jet fighters and they were still making Spitfires. They didn't want it to go away. <laughs> yes, sir. Is this excess Israeli? Thank you for reminding me what I'm supposed to be talking about. This particular spit uh, was with the 312 squadron uh, near Duxford in World War II 
with the 312 was all Czech pilots who escaped the Blitz in 39. And at the end of the war, the RAF gave to the people of Czechoslovakia quite a number of almost brand new Spitfires to reconstitute their Air Force. And this was one of those Spitfires. And it went across to Czechoslovakia then uh, from 1945 to 48. And it's painted in the scheme of that period in honor of Karol Posta, who was the leader of the Czech fighters after World War II. And he has his uh, first initial on the cowl. He would only fly in a Spitfire if it had either a K or a P on it. And if you survive the Blitz, the Battle of France, the Battle of Britain, and the recovery of the continent, you can say what goes on your cowl. <laughs> wow. So Carol's job in the years after World War II was to fly the countryside and demonstrate the airplane to raise the morale of the people. No country, everything's in shambles, no jobs, no food. And he was demonstrating this before crowds of over 100,000 people on a routine basis. So we call it the world's first air show Spitfire. 48, when uh, Russia orchestrated a coup in Czechoslovakia, it was sold to Israel. It was in the war in the desert for five years. Uh, Israel went all turban in 54. It was sold on to Burma. It was in Burma for many years. It sustained some serious damage and was sold into a museum. And uh, an English group of collectors noticed it in the corner of a museum gathering dust with a T6 tail and cellophane windscreen and said, uh, we think that's a Spitfire, will you sell it to us as a kit? And they disassembled it, went through a couple of ownerships, and ended up back at Duxford. And it went into the inventory of Historic Flying Limited, uh, waiting for somebody to come along with uh, uh, a dearth of common sense and a, a few pounds sterling to put it back together. And that's when we started working together in 2007. So it was a three-year restoration, and then we took it apart in England without having flown it, brought it here, reassembled it in October. And I think some of you know that story. It was reassembled in three days and flown on the fourth day. So, and that was one of the better examples of cooperation by a FISDO that I've, I've ever seen. Um, they were so excited that we were doing this and that it was actually working out that one of the uh, inspectors took the Thursday afternoon off and drove out the uh, certificate of airworthiness so we could fly that day. Hmm. Showed up on his Harley and handed it into the cockpit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, was a different day. Yes, sir? There was a Mark 16 spent sitting on her belly in the wheat from Don Lang, in the late 50s. Has that ever recovered? I'm not aware. I'm not aware. There are approximately uh, 30 Spitfires flying, of which about uh, about 20 are in England. There was a period when, under English law, you could not export a Spitfire. That's how important it is to the people of England. Yes, sir. John, do you know if there's any, is anybody in the audience know if any worried about those Burma Spits that were found buried in the boxes? There was like 16 or something that were. Well, Very the was, they weren't found. That was, that's the problem. They're still, uh, they're still looking. They're still trying to decide whether they are there or if they aren't there. Oh, they right. went out there several times and didn't find anything. Oh. The guy who started it all is still adamant that they are there, but the university also did a paper study of what Bitfires went to Burma in cargo containers, and there's no actual rep physical records of the actual missing planes now. Almost needle in a haystack then, eh? Yeah. Oh my God. But this, we're still hopeful. We, uh, yeah, we get that question quite a bit. And uh, the only two things I will say in reply are, uh, isn't it terrible what bad behavior ensues after a treasure hunt goes wrong? <laughs> and um, isn't it surprising that we haven't seen one yet? <laughs> yes, sir. Quite a few years I was there, he was there with his double stick. Tell me about the double stick. 
uh, Bill Greenwood is his yeah. name? Yeah, and there's also a, a TR Mark 9 in Duxford where they sell rides and give training, which is where I went to learn something. It's about 18 inches longer. The, uh, the TF Mustang looks good. The, the two bubble Spitfire, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, fly it as long as you have to and then move on. <laughs> Not much of a compromise in performance though. Mm. Yes, sir. Um, I don't know if anyone's interested, but uh, back in 2001, there was a movie, uh, kind of a historic uh, fiction put out about the Czechoslovakian pilots during the early days of World War II called uh, Dark Blue World. And it's a very interesting movie if anyone's interested about it. It kind of chronicles from the beginning in 1939 all the way up to basically 1950. <coughs> a lot of the returning pilots were coming back that had actually fought against the Soviets in a lot of instances and kind of their trials and tribulations about how they were treated under Soviet rule. It's very interesting movie. It's a lot of uh, Spitfire uh, uh, flying there. It's a fabulous movie and it affected me greatly. Uh, I, I saw it uh, a month before we had the discussion of paint scheme. Yeah. <laughs> Where would you locate that? Amazon? Check Netflix. I think I saw it on Netflix. It's got some great aerial footage. The, uh, this particular uh, spit we brought in in October of 2010. And um, I'm up to 125 hours, so it's holding together nicely. Yes, sir. What's the fuel consumption on this Oh, thing? very good point. And that will be the transition to the person we all came to hear. Because <laughs> he was a recon spit pilot in a plane quite similar to this. Now, normally the Spitfire, it says 87 gallons. But let me tell you about the fuel system. <laughs> it's all in front of the pilot. It's just in front of the, uh, the windscreen there. And it's really two tanks. It's uh, 48 usable. 37 usable. They're on top of each other. And did I mention this was engineered in England? <laughs> the fuel gauge is, you know, you can burn 60 gallons an hour in this thing if you fly it like Bud Granley, you know. <laughs> High performance flying. You can get it down to about 35 on long distance, such as going to Berlin. But um, the gauge doesn't start till you get in your last 37 gallons. <laughs> and uh, Bud's not laughing. You know. <laughs> and you kind of think, okay, I've been in the air so long and I've kind of been playing with the throttles. I might be starting into that bottom tank. You have to push a button to see, to make the needle work. So it's really a plane made for an octopus. <laughs> got all this stuff going on, and oh, by the way, push a button to see if you've got 30 gallons, 28, 26, 20 left. And then, in very small print, it's got whether or not the reading is accurate on the ground or in the air. So you're recalibrating for that. This particular airplane is stock Mark 9 with a couple of exceptions. And one of them is we have some of the recon fuel in the wings. There are two bladders in each wing, so when you take a close look at it later, you'll see there are bladders of 14 and a half gallons and 13 gallons in each wing. And you can move those to the main. Now, you do the math, you've got 48, 37, 27 and a half on each wing. You're trying to figure out how far down you are into the top one. And then you put the pump on, put it in the top one. You can't tell where you are because you didn't get to 37, right? You with me? You're doing all this in the air. But at least you have another hour of range by virtue of these bladders in the wing. And uh, some of the uh, photo recon Mark 11s had other kinds of enhancements to the fuel system that uh, added range. But it really is built as an interceptor. So that's why I find the, the statistic that says that to me is that in the Battle of Britain, 30% of the landings 
were at airports other than where the planes took off. And it wasn't to see a friend. <laughs> so that's why when I think of flying solo at high altitude in one of these things, all the way to Berlin, taking pictures and trying to get home, I think what a remarkable thing it was. So I hope that answers enough of your inquiries about the fuel system and the rest of Spitfire. And if not, we'll certainly be around later. And I'd like so to... So I uh, did a little quick bio on him. And we'll get a chance after this also to ask specific questions that I'm sure you have on the aircraft. Well, let's start out here. Uh, Colonel Bly joined the uh, Oregon Air National Guard while he's in high school. Uh, graduated from high school in 1940, already a corporal in the National Guard out of high school. In September of 1940, while on active duty up here at Fort Lewis, he heard about the Flying Sergeant Program and applied for it and was accepted. Uh, a lot of people don't realize they had a lot of pilots during World War II who were sergeants or chiefs in the Navy that flew aircraft fighters and all kinds. Uh, other notable people were Chuck Yeager, who was a, a flying sergeant also until later on when he got his rank and, and, and promoted. Uh, flight training started in Santa Maria, California in the Stearman. So all the guys got to fly the Stearman, went through, most of the guys did, which is a real experience. He had a couple of, uh, well, I hope we get him to talk about some of the Stearman experiences he had. Basic flight training was Merced, flying the BT-13, which is a standard airplane for the Army Air Corps at that time for basic training. Uh, I was going to mention, too, that uh, he was uh, out of high school, he was like 19 years old when he was accepted into this program. Uh, he always wanted to fly, from talking to him, he always looked forward to maybe getting an airplane or flying. Uh, he was thinking, of, of course, about the other services, uh, but the Army Air Corps required a minimum of 18 years of age, two years of college, or college equivalency, which means most of them are a little bit older uh, than that. So he was able to get into the flying program much younger, with no uh, college at all. He graduated from flight training, well, excuse me, the advanced flight training was at uh, Phoenix, Arizona, at uh, Williams Air Force Base. Is that still there? Yeah, okay. Uh, Air Force Base, flying the AT-9, which is a Cessna. I had to look that up and see what AT-9 was. It's kind of a funny little airplane with big twin engines on it, a little bitty uh, bulb cockpit that sat kind of further back, and I think it was for like, five people was about all that it would hold but for training. It had to be a squirrely little thing to fly. And then after that, he got the AT-10, uh, um, AT which is the Beechcraft. Very similar to the Beechcraft Twin, twin Beach. And that was a standard airplane, of course. Now they know he's going to go uh, multi-engine at that time. The other guys went in advance, like AT-6s or something else. Upon uh, graduation, like I mentioned, he got his wings and was made a buck sergeant. So no matter if you went in as a recruit, when you got your wings, you automatically became a buck sergeant. So he did that, and then uh, from then went on to Colorado Springs awaiting orders. Upon, uh, uh, he was assigned at Colorado Springs, he was assigned to the Photo Recon Division and Squadron flying the F-4. And I always think of F-4 as a fan. Well, the F-4 in these days was a, uh, was a P-38. It was a photo version of the P-38. And later they came out with an advanced version of F-5, uh, which is a P-38. Cameras only, and uh, unarmed, of course, on that. Uh, it was, of course, a modified uh, P-38G model was the modification on it. At the time, though, flying in the P-38 on the training, he had some very interesting stories. I'm hoping to get him to talk a little bit about the P-38, his first flights, and, and kind of how hairy they were. And a P-38, I imagine a young guy, 20 years old, getting a P-38, and the guy says, just push those two things up and go fly. And so <laughs> they had a lot of problems with it. Typical problems he was talking about was at that time, you know, they didn't teach too much on VMCA, VMCG. And so the guys would get in there and go, mm, and release the brakes, and of course one engine would spool up before the other one, and off they go, across the country out there. And they had, and that had some uh, crashes. He mentioned one of his uh, other fellows was, was killed in a crash there. But anyway, and then they finally figured out to spool them both up with the brakes on max until it was just about ready to go and smooth it in to make sure that trials came on evenly, and the directional control was a little bit easier to maintain. He has a couple of little stories on that. It's pretty neat. One of the things that I thought was uh, fascinating is before he flew that, they had him go to a B-25 to 
to fly B-25s. He didn't get checked out in it, but he had to take off and landings in it. At that time, they wanted to teach these guys how to land the nose wheel landing gear airplane. Everything else was a tail wheel airplane. So that was a whole new experience of B-25. Later on, after he flew in the war, he came back, and then he was an instructor on a B-25. Of course, went through the whole process of teaching and how it all worked. But that's pretty neat, I thought. Okay. In May of 1943, he was assigned to the 22nd Photo Reconnaissance Squadron based in Mount Farm, uh, RAF uh, in, in England, uh, where he uh, celebrated his 21st birthday at that time. As, uh, in September of uh, 1943, it was his first mission. He flew the F-5, which is the, the P-38 photo version of it, and, uh, and had a lot of problems with the F-5. And we're going to ask him some questions on that so you can kind of get down into it. The, the video, Spitfire 944, shows a little bit of the problems, of course, with the supercharger on that and what would come the aircraft it was. And apparently they didn't have problems like uh, with the P-38 in the Pacific because of the, the warmer temperatures and less moisture and, and the altitudes they were flying weren't quite as high. Okay, after... Uh, uh, well, let's see, after... Nine, oh, I'm sorry, the, the uh, F, F, uh, the Spitfire, he got Spitfires in uh, 1944, and they designated the new squadron as uh, 14th Photo Reconnaissance Division, and they got Spitfires, the Mark 11s, which was a uh, modified Mark 9 without armor uh, or guns, and uh, you'll notice in the film here, the front windscreen is even different. They didn't have a bulletproof screen on it. It looks almost like a T-34 rounded windshield screen. So, of course, it wouldn't stop much, but it was to lighten the aircraft. So, he was being prepared to do these missions. Uh, single engine, unescorted, uh, long range aircraft uh, flights, cleared into Berlin and back, one of the further missions that he had to do. Later, he was assigned after he, was, after he did 44, I mean, 51 missions of flying, he returned to the United States as a rank of a captain. So, from there, he uh, later was assigned back in Europe and also in Japan, flying the F-86s and he flew the Air National Guard, uh, the P-51. Uh, a lot of time in that, he had more time with P-51 than, than the Spitz, but every time I talked to him, he said he just loved to fly the Spitfire. It was his airplane of the dreams. He said it was fantastic to fly. I returned to Tacoma after, and with his wife, Virginia, his two sons and their daughter, and retired in 1968. Hmm. So that's basically a bio. And then we're gonna go ahead to a question answer period. And uh, our CEO's and Ron's going to come up here and sit and take some questions. Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. We're going to do the video first. So two, two videos. The first one is the one that's kind of showing up there now. And it's just a, it's a non-color, I mean, it's a color video, non, uh, no sound. But it's about the squadron and some of the other guys are in it. He would probably recognize some of the pilots who are there. After that video, then we have a little bit longer video of a... Uh, of Spitfire 944, which some of you have seen, and if you have not, incredible pictures. All right, here we go. Yeah. American division in Europe, uh, but the Americans flew for this aircraft. This is the Mark 11 with the cameras in it. Now notice the canopy. Under the nose chin there, there's a canopy, look at that. It's like a little T-34, did not it? Uh, and under the nose, right around the nose, uh, there's this extra fuel tank. The leading edges of the wings, all the guns were taken out. Big fuel tanks were stored in the leading edges. What's amazing is you came back and did that belly landing, and first you got to worry about that tank been ruptured on that landing. The color is it's called a, the the color is a blue. They thought it would blend in more at high altitudes. They put a couple guys clowning around it. And there he goes on his mission. So, do, do we know the story of the video? Who was making the video? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, once again, the same doctor that made the other video, 944. Yeah. These were discovered after the war. They'll talk about this in the 944 video. And uh, what a magnificent thing that is to have this on, on record. You know, a lot of the guys had experiences like this, but they didn't have the fortune, fortune uh, to have video of them coming back and, and the things.
things that they did. So that's what makes this, I think, so so important is you can actually see what he's doing and see the airplanes and see him. I said, well, with that narrow landing gear, uh, I bet that was a little bit of a squirrely thing to take off and land. And he said, no, it's landed pretty easy. <laughs> I imagine easy to some people may not be easy to everybody. They had two cameras in there. Well, I just trail him in. Imagine he's been up there now for several hours trying to get out of that little cramp thing. Probably can barely walk. Probably freezing cold. Another thing I thought was uh, incredible, I never realized that, that the altitudes they were flying up there was above 35,000 feet a lot of times. And sometimes they went up to 40,000 feet. Now remember, this is non-pressure breathing. Uh, remember, the airlines, anything above 35,000, the automatic pressure breather cut in and, and forced you to, uh, to, to make the oxygen go in your bloodstream. So you wonder how many of these guys went on missions and basically just hypoxic and passed out and were, and were lost. And so you wonder uh, at that altitude, plus the temperatures. Had, like I said, no heater in it. And uh, so it's pretty amazing that, uh, some of the things that these guys were doing. Okay? Yes, now here's the second film. This is one. I won't have to talk about this one. Or anybody? Just, uh, <laughs> Just breathe that <laughs> I'm going to provide the link to this photo. We know we have a little hearing problem, so I'm going to stick up here with, uh, with the Colonel and uh, anybody that has any questions. Uh, first thing I thought was uh, if you'd like to just tell us what we didn't see on the film. What else? Uh, how did you really feel about flying Spitfire? <laughs> what? How did you really feel about flying it? Flying? Spitfire. I loved it. Can you look closer? It was a very nice airplane. I've been flying the F 5, which was a photo recon version of the B 38. And at altitude in Europe, they were. With the cold, a lot of times you wouldn't get the turbo supercharger regulator working right, so you'd lose an engine and have to feather it and everything. We got the Homer L. Sanders came in as our commander, colonel, and uh, later major general. But uh, he took a Spitfire uh, P-38 up one day and he opened a wide open. He blew up the one engine that went over and knocked out the other engine and he came in and landed on with one engine and right away he put in for Spitfires. <laughs> we were going to uh, equip with Spitfires because that's what the British were flying. They weren't having any trouble at all. And uh, Elliot Roosevelt came up and formed a wing. He came up from Africa and took over and Elliot was dead set against the British having anything to do with the American Air Force, so we ended up with one squadron. I was in the 22nd flying F-5s, and I wanted to fly the Spitfire, so I asked for a transfer, and they sent me to the 14th, which was on the same base, and I started flying the Spitfire, and I flew, uh, well, 40, eight missions, uh, 46 missions of the Spit. I already flew on four or five in the F-5, and I loved the Spitfire. I didn't have any problem with it. I went over Berlin. I spent half an hour in Berlin with it. I took, uh, I was the main, one of the main pilots taking pictures of the Buzzmon sites, and the uh, Spitfire was very good for it, but you had to roll it completely up on your side. But, F-5, which was a P-38, you couldn't do that because then one engine would be in your way. Mm -hmm. And you, so you couldn't uh, get a good shot at the target because it was from 15,000 feet, all the buzz bomb sites. So I, I was the main pilot taking them all on the coast, even though it was a big British Africa bomb. And, and uh, I love the Spitfire for it. But, but it it's, roll over and I could see the target come around and take pictures of it. And I took the most of those long sites on the Potty Calais where they were shooting in London. I'd go to London and I'd get shot at with the buzz bombs. I'd go back to base and I'd fly a mission over the buzz bomb sites. And uh, 
did a lot of uh, deep work too, like uh, Munich. I went to Munich, uh, Czechoslovakia, and, and a Spitfire. People didn't believe the Spit would go that far, but with the belly tank and the, where they took out the guns, you had other tanks right behind you. So I had five and a half hours fuel. I spent half an hour in Berlin taking pictures. Uh, I love the Spitfire. I had a got intercepted in it. We'd been losing F5s, which is a P-38, and they, so they started the sending in in Spitfires. And I had a F-109 to make a dive on me, and I played like I didn't see him. <laughs> and I, I saw him disappear and back on me, and I figured he'd miss him out ready to shoot, and I pulled straight back on the stick, which I couldn't have done in an F-5 at 30,000 feet. Went straight up. And at 35,000 feet, I rolled over, and I could see him sitting down there, and he was <laughs> turning all directions, trying to figure out what the hell happened. To him. <laughs> <laughs> he was waiting for you to stall out, end up in front of him, right? He was waiting for you to stall, and end up in front of him, right? Yeah. And so uh, I watched him disappear, and so I went ahead with the mission. I was behind Berlin when I was doing that, but. I love the Spitfire, and I uh, I took it every place. In fact, uh, most of the buzz bomb sites, I was the main pilot, and with the Spitfire, you could see it. But with an F-5, 38, you couldn't. Uh, you'd have to take it clear up on its side to try and see the target. Because once you once you got on your side like that brought it around and then you had to roll over and be right on top of it to get the pictures and the Spitfire, you could stick it right up on the wing and get a good shot at it. So I, I went to Munich, I went to uh, German, uh, Berlin, uh, I did a lot of buzz bomb sites. Uh, all yeah, time. yeah. Uh, question on the, uh, you mentioned something that was very interesting on your a Spitfire turning bank indicator, and how that was a very dangerous setup for, a, for American pilots. Ken, Ken said, could you describe the turning bank indicator? You said that was a, a strange oh, system. Oh, a Spitfire, instead of a needle ball, they had two needles, and nobody told us about it. The, the, the bottom needle was the top needle on an American airplane, the top needle is the same as the ball. And so we lost a couple of guys, and I think that they might have been, it might have been because nobody ever told them that the needles were reversed on it. And I, did, I wasn't told, and I got a second mission, I went into the clouds about 5,000 feet, and uh, all of a sudden everything seemed off on the instrument panel, I started kicking the instruments and I came back out the bottom of the clouds and I finally figured out, well, these damn needles are backwards. <laughs> it's an American airplane, nobody had told us. That's the British. That's the British for you. <laughs> now, I was wondering, what was your reaction when they first told you you weren't going to have guns? What was your reaction when you found out you weren't going to have guns? Oh, I didn't have any... Uh, negative thoughts about it, and I figured that, well, I just had to put up with it because I'd be by myself anyway, and you're not going to be fighting a dog fight if you're by yourself, even if there's three or four guys after you. So uh, there wasn't any room for guns. With the uh, cameras, they took up all the space that the or, uh, guns would have taken up, and on a Spitfire, in back of the cockpit, they didn't have anything, but on, on ours, they had the cameras back there because they put in extra fuel and they had a belly tank and I could go five and a half hours with the fuel, but a, spit, a fighter spit could only go about an hour and a half with the fuel. And I wanted to fly a Spitfire because we did, did, didn't have the trouble at altitude we did with the F-5 or anything. With the Hick. Um, what, what did you have to do to check out the Spitfire and, and how was it in takeoffs and landings? 
What was the checkout like in this big one? Uh, I hadn't, I'd gone through a base, uh, advanced in twin engine at Williams Field, and uh, I was flying twin engine at Colorado Springs when we were in training to go overseas, but then when we got Spitfires, we wanted to fly Spitfires, and there wasn't any problem with flying them. The landing gear is really close together, and a lot of people think that that was terrible, but actually it was well balanced, and if you flew right, uh, if you're a bad pilot, you're going to have trouble. <laughs> <laughs> if you came in and made a nice approach and everything, it, it was stable as could be. There wasn't any problem at all. I've got a lot more time in a P-51 than I do in a Spitfire, and a P-51 gear is further away, but I didn't have any trouble with Either one of them. You mentioned uh, coming in for a, a run at 15,000 feet. Is that the normal altitude you use for, uh, for the photo runs? What was your normal altitude for the photo runs? Uh, photo runs, uh, it depended on what you were taking because most of the time you'd, be, you'd go up and you'd hit contrails, over, uh, which over Europe were about 30,000 feet. And then you drop down about 500,000 feet below, like doing Berlin or Munich or one of those uh, targets. So when the weather was good, summertime and everything, you just drop down to below 30,000 feet here in the clear, so there wasn't any problem at all. But in wintertime, the contrails over Europe had come down about 15,000 feet and below us, and so you just climb. Uh, as high as you could and make contrails and forget about getting intercepted. Well, you wouldn't actually forget about it, but I <laughs> you, uh, you felt a lot safer. Uh, Paul? Yeah, how did the Air, Air Corps uh, select the uh, fighter pilots and the multi-engine pilot? Uh, Paul, so how, did they, how did they select the fighter pilots and the multi-engine pilots? Did you have to be better? <laughs> no, I, got, I graduated from uh, uh, Williams Air Force Base in Twin Engine, and uh, we went to Colorado Springs, and the airfield wasn't built then. They were still working on it, and so we reported to a storefront downtown, and they gave us a 30-day leave to get out of there. But they didn't even. We slept on the floor in the old Safeway store, <laughs> and. Uh, they said, get out of here and go home for 30 days and maybe we'll have barracks for you when you get back. So that's what I did. I went home and spent 30 days and came back. Yeah. Dave? How often did you have uh, enemy fighters come up and try to intercept you? How often did you get intercepted by enemy fighters? Were they attempted? I've, I've never counted how many times I got intercepted, but I was intercepted several times, and uh, each one was different. Because I used to go up and hit contrails at 30,000 feet, which summertime over Europe, that's where you hit the contrails, and then I'd drop down about 500 to 1,000 feet, and that way you could see, you hope you could see anyone up above you. <coughs> uh, Liggett? Yeah, I wonder if you ever got involved in the buzz bomb wing kicking yeah. Were you ever involved with the buzz bomb wing tipping deal? Have you ever? The what? They used to use a technique to get rid of the buzz bomb by tipping their wings. Were you ever that close to one? No. Okay. Go ahead. The normal mission was 25 missions, and then you were completed. How did you get to 48 missions? Was the normal mission count 25 before you went home? That, that's what we start that as, but then they raised to about 30, and then they did away with that. And I, I ended up flying 53. Lucky you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was my, my own choice. I could have I could have gone home. Okay. But I, I figured we'd never get another chance to fight a war like that with a Spitfire. <laughs> so I, I stayed on. <laughs> Go ahead. How did 
you like flying the steerman in the early days? <laughs> How was the steerman flying? Where? How was the steerman flying? The uh, steerman was nice. I, I went to uh, Santa Maria to Hancock College of Aeronautics. They were the primary school, and I flew the steerman. And I had a really good instructor, and I didn't have any trouble with it. We have a couple of steerman pilots in the group here. Oh, you do? <laughs> well, I. I like the steerman as a bit twin uh, biplane, and uh, I've realized that in combat you wouldn't have a biplane. So uh, I had a really good instructor too, and I went through the Hancock College of Aeronautics in Santa Maria, which was outside of Randolph Field was one of the top schools in the early days, and then they expanded on the school program. But I went through. 42G, which was uh, graduated in July of 42, and they start, they were starting up a lot of the schools at that time and getting civilian instructors to instruct. And I had a really good at civilian instructor. Good. Um, after you got home, did you keep flying? Did you fly after you retired? I flew with the National Guard uh, in Portland and uh, was one of the original pilots when we formed it in 46. And I flew with them for about five years and then I got recalled and I uh, flew the F-86 for a while. And then they put us in base flight, which uh, flies C-47 and everything, and B-25. So after the Spitfire, what are your some, are some of your other favorite airplanes? Your favorite airplanes other than the Spitfire? Well, P-51 was a very nice airplane. I like the old B-25 for a twin-engine airplane. I went through, uh, after I came home, I went through with advanced uh, training on a B-25, and I'd take up students and show them how to fly instruments and everything. Use that around here. And you know, <laughs> how the different approaches that you had with the uh, radio control coming in. Wow. Justin? How good or bad were your living conditions in England at the base? Good food, bad food, good beds, bad beds? How was the English food? <laughs> <laughs> or all well, your conditions there? For what they had to work with. Uh, wasn't that bad. How was the living conditions? Barracks? Uh, the living conditions were pretty fair. I had a separate room all to myself. So uh, I didn't have any problem with living conditions. We had a good officer's mess for food. I, yes, I, I believe on the bio he became an officer. He was, uh, I, I heard captain in country, if you will. Can he speak to that and how he, if it changed his uh, his own thoughts and sure. people's behavior? When you were uh, promoted to an officer, how did that change things? Did you actually ha have some respect then? <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, it didn't change much at all. People treated us as pilots, and whether we were enlisted pilots or uh, officer pilots. I didn't notice any difference. In fact, when we were enlisted pilots, the enlisted men were actually kind of proud of us. And uh, uh, they treated us very, very well. And then they did away with it. They came out with flight officer. They made us all flight officers. And then when I got to England, they uh, called us up to London. They were, I'd gone before board after board. They were, It'd be 12 officers, a lot of like supply officers and everything, and they'd ask you silly questions. And <laughs> so uh, when we got, they tore everything up and we went to England, and they had to start all over again. They called us to London, and there must have been 250 of us in this room. And uh, this one uh, colonel was sitting there, and he said, I've been before boards of 12 officers and everything, and they tore up the papers when we got transferred and everything. And this one colonel said, I'm the board. He said today, 
you're all second lieutenants. <laughs> and, uh, he said, I hope ne by next year you're all generals. <laughs> and he said, I'm sorry I had to get you down in London, but it says you had to go before a board. Well, he said, I'm the board. <laughs> and that was the end of that. Go ahead. Colonel thanks for coming. I'm interested in uh, how did you keep warm in this bit fire over such an altitude and for so long? What kind of uh, flight suit and uh, jacket or things you poured in the flights in the spit to stay warm? And how cold was it? Well, it was very cold, and I I picked up a flying suit. To, we went back to Wright Patterson, and we went into the clothing department where uh, about three of us went in there, and this. Uh, civilian was showing us his new ex experimental flying suit, and it was lined. It was a one-piece suit that was lined and everything. And he uh, gave me one of them, and gave the other two guys suits too. And uh, we told him, we promised him faithfully, we'd write to him and uh, tell us how we were getting along. We got to England, and the English were issuing the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I noticed an A2 jacket, and uh, that's what they came out with as a two-piece, but I didn't like it because the pants came up, and then you'd have a uh, jacket over it, too, and then you'd, with a parachute on the uh, dinghy and back out while well, you're sitting on the dinghy with a backpack. And it, that push you closer to the instrument panel and everything, but the A2 jacket was the norm, but I've got this uh, man at the, at the right pad gave three of us a one-piece flying suit that uh, was developed by the same people that developed the climbing gear for Mount Everest and everything. And it, it was actually like an A2 jacket, but it was a full length fly suit. And guys used to swipe it. I'd go down to uh, where we kept our clothes, and I'd find someone who was flying the mission with my the flying suit. So I had to pray that he didn't get shot back. And then I was worried about him, I was worried about my flying suit. <laughs> You'd have to draw the course on the map to the, each target to go to, and, and where you'd cross out from England. Um, we had about three or four cross out points, and from there on, you'd take a compass heading and just we had them on the map the line that we were supposed to fly, and uh, we make our own up our own uh, navigation map. There's actually, uh, there's actually one of his maps over here with, uh, with the uh, corridors drawn on it going into Berlin and Berlin and things if someone wants to look at them later. And there's a whole bunch of pictures up here uh, of uh, him back then and uh, the airplanes and things. Ken? We use an E6B computer to... The good old fashioned way. <laughs> how, did you, how did you learn the squadron was going to get Spitfires? How did they tell you you were going to get Spitfires in your squadron? Well, I was flying with this English girl. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> she knew. We were in London and uh, she wanted me to... She wanted, to this part. <laughs> you know, she wanted me to meet her uncle one day. And uh, she introduced me to different clubs that were kind of exclusive clubs because she knew a lot of top people and her uncle, we were going to have lunch with him, he walked in and it turned out he was Air Marshal Peck. He <laughs> 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 was one of the top people in the RAF and they, later on they made him Air Marshal Sir Richard Peck. But I'd, uh, we'd go to London and he'd, because he didn't have any children of his own, she was his favorite. And 
we'd go have lunch with him and everything. I even spent a weekend with him down the country and everything. But he was a very nice gentleman. He knew Ira Eaker and everything. So I got in on uh, some things. That even my uh, colonel of commanding, I came back one day and I said, Colonel, we're going to get Spitfires. I'd like to be able to fly. And he says, where did you hear that? And I said, Air Marshal Sir Richard Peck. And he just shook his head. And Homer L. Sanders, he became a major general after that. But every two weeks we'd have a party. And even after he got transferred, he'd come and he'd We'd have this party and he had this English gal he used to dance with and he danced by me and he said, Lieutenant, where did you hear that? <laughs> and then he'd just shake his head. He never did believe me. I knew an air marshal. What were the communication protocols like during your missions? I would imagine over a continent there's no talking on the radio. What, uh, what kind of communications did you do? Did you, were you radio out the whole time? Or? Right. Yeah. Yeah radio, four channel VHF set, and uh, we'd home in the, on a DF station, and uh, most of the time I'd come into the English coast and land at uh, DF station, either at, uh, the east coast or the south coast, and then uh, refuel and then fly to the home base. Did you ever use any radio voice communications? Uh, what do you mean, voice? Wait, did you, uh, coming, coming back over England, did you have yeah. to report it? Yeah, it was a voice okay. between us and the ground station. Yeah. And uh, they were very good, the British station. We've been at it a long time, so I'd land at Bradwell Bay, which was on the east coast, or the south coast, and land down there, too, and uh, uh, they, uh, had very good communications with us with VHF, and I didn't have it. We had a four channel set, and we didn't have any problem really, except when I went out. <laughs> John, um, how long was your longest mission, and how long did the average mission last? What, what was the length on average of the mission? What was your longest? Well, the average mission was probably about two and a half, three hours, but. I'd fly sometimes five and a half hours, which is our maximum range. And I went to Berlin and I spent about half an hour in Berlin with six targets. Or I went to Munich, and Munich was as, about as far as we went. I took targets all over the Munich area, too. Justin, have you ever had a chance to meet, after the war, any German pilots? Did you ever meet any German pilots after the war? No. Or <laughs> during? <laughs> well, I, I met one or two of them from. On that issue about German pilots, I met, I've met several of them since the war. They had a great deal of respect for the American fighter. He's a former pilot. He's met some of the German pilots and said they had great respect for the uh, the photo, for the photo reconnaissance pilots? Well, all of them. Oh, oh. So you were well respected by the Germans. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought they were cuts of the cell. Tell us a little bit about your first flight in the P-38. Uh, that's kind of interesting. Your first P-38 flight. <laughs> I don't know. I graduated from twin engine advanced at Williams and I was a sergeant pilot and uh, got in the P-38 and flew it <laughs> in Colorado Springs. Some do the temperatures, the engine temperature. You had engine temperature problems with it or was it? Well, at first I had temperature problems because there wasn't any way to set the temperature on it. And so you'd finally get so that you just set it at a certain uh, place, and then if you had to correct it uh, later on, it was okay, but at first I'd yo-yo it. I, I, I didn't know how to come with a basic setting on the 
uh, temperature. And there wasn't any basic way to actually figure it out. Dave? <laughs> Did uh, some of the photo recon units in your area use mosquitoes, and what did you think of those, and did you ever get a chance to fly them? Did uh, other units use the mosquito? And Dave's wondering if you ever had a chance to fly the mosquito. Well, I never had a chance. Well, I did have a chance to fly it, but uh, when Elliot Roosevelt came up from Africa, he set up two. Well, there was our group, and then they set up another group at Watton. And uh, I went to London and took the night vision test. To, the, the British gave it to us. And I passed that, and I came back, and instead of us getting uh, mosquitoes, they went to a separate unit at Watton. And I didn't want to transfer because I, I loved the Spitfire. And so I stayed with the Spitfire. <coughs> But I passed the night vision test. That's good. Go ahead. One of the German fighter pilots uh, emigrated to uh, Vancouver. His name was Franz Stigler. And uh, he spoke to us at the court, one of our formal dining in, to give the, the German story. Yeah. Very interesting. And after the dinner was over with, I was chatting with him, and I told him that I was on B 17s up on the Eastern Front. Vienna, Prague, Berlin. He smiled and he pointed to the star on his forehead and he said, A B 17 gave me that. <laughs> what was his name? Franz Stiegler. Franz Stiegler? Ever heard of him? He wrote a book. He, he wrote a book, and you might find it in the museum bookstore. It's called A Higher Call, and it's an amazing story. Excellent book. He wrote a book called The Higher Call. No, but I met a German pilot at the court. Have you been court? Is that court? him? Have you sent him? Okay. No. Front front I met him then. Okay. Go ahead, way back. I was wondering, uh, in Spitfire, English weather, how you handled icing, especially when you're being directed with radar. Did you ever have a problem with icing? No, I never really did. That's easy. <laughs> On the B-17, uh, they removed the, the icer boots on the aircraft. We had to climb through conditions that were contributing to icing, but they were a detriment because uh, any aircraft fire or machine gun fire would shred the boots, and aerodynamically that was more of a problem. So they removed all the boots and we didn't fly with them. Did you just fly through the icing areas quickly to get above? Right. Okay. Well, that's the way they did it. <laughs> well, we the, the ice was, so we just changed levels. Okay. I'd go to 40,000 feet sometimes. So what was your most frightening flying experience? <laughs> what was your most frightening flying experience? All of them. I don't know. Well, I belly landed once and the Spitfire couldn't get the gear down and they had a, a CO2 bottle and it had a handle on it that stuck up like that. My headset got caught and I jerked on the cord and uh, I didn't realize it, but I, the lever came down and it had a lead seal on it and the needle went through the lead seal. And the, emergency landing system went off the left, put so much pressure in the lines and jammed up my gear and I didn't realize that, I, that it happened and I came back down uh, from a mission and I went to land and I wheeled around, pushed the handle and the handle bounced back at me and uh, I figured that Hell, something happened that the emergency system had gone off and it jammed up the landing gear when I pushed on the, when the handle got caught and I cut on the cord. And so I flew around for about half an hour and they got all the crash equipment out and everything and I came in and made a belly landing and uh, they got it on film and the flight service made a he was out there taking the <coughs> out of it and he got it 
of the film. And, uh, they jacked it up, lowered the gear, changed the radiators on, and I was flying it again. <laughs> Great. We probably should start wrapping this up. Any last minute? Go ahead, Ken. There was a question about the selection process for fighter pilots, bomber pilots, and that sort of thing. And the Santa Ana Aviation Cadet Center, they had a one-week psychomotor testing program, and they tested you for everything under the sun. And you'd come out of it with a number. And um, I remember number nine, you had the privilege of selecting whether you wanted to be a pilot, bombardier, or navigator. If you had any number less than that, it was addressed to the different uh, skill areas that they figured was optimum for a bombardier, navigator, or pilot. Also on that, it depended on your height. If you were yeah, yeah. shorter, you are <laughs> going to fight a fight. Yeah. If you were uh, six foot or over, you're, you're going to go in the bomber. Not so. <laughs> that was six foot five. Uh, the uh, selection uh, process. <laughs> 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 what was the rule when they assigned you a number? <laughs> it was a three rule. Okay. And in between the number and your height, depending on whether you were the fighters or the bombers. Because these guys are bomber guys. You said you got intercepted multiple times. What did that look like? Did they actually spot your aircraft? Did they get close? Or when you, when you did get intercepted those couple of times, what, did, what was it like? Did they see your airplane or did they intercept you because they saw your contrails? No, they I don't know, I didn't talk to them. <laughs> 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 well, I had a couple of them right on my tail. And uh, one of them came out of a dive and I watched him. Because if you panic too soon and you do something, he can lock in on you. So I kept watching him and played like I didn't see him. And I saw him disappearing back on me. And I figured, well, he's had time, he's sitting on my tail, and he's getting all the switches turned on and everything. He's about ready to get me out of the Spitfire, and I pulled straight back, and I went up about 5,000 feet from 30,000 to 35,000. I rolled over, and there he is down there zigzagging. He wondered where the hell I went. <laughs> and I've gone straight up. And couldn't figure that one out. You know, it, it took this long to get him to start talking with his hands. <laughs> I, it's hard to believe. Uh, uh, Carol By, we really appreciate you coming. And uh, if uh, Bob, could you bring up the little uh, memento for him? One of our one of our squadron members, Bob Hill, is a really skilled model, and he did this for you. Uh, that's, uh, this is from the Cascade Warbirds for you to take home with you as a reminder of your visit. We, we could have shredded the propeller and laid it on its belly, but we thought it looked better in one piece. And I want to thank Kent again for setting this up and your son for coming with you, and uh, we hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Here, here.